welcome to our panel, The Relationship Between Qigong and Western Medicine. Our panelists today, Dr. Gloria Ye, Dr. Shin Lin, and Dr. Roger Janka, are the A-team of knowledge about this important subject. They bring years of dedicated research into the relationship of mind-body practices to Western medicine. And I am excited to have this wonderful opportunity to hear from each of them about their experience, practice, and insights about this cutting edge topic. After they each share, we will have some time to dig in a little deeper. Let's start with Dr. Gloria Ye, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Director of Mind-Body Research in the Division of General Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and the Director of Clinical Research at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine based at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. She directs the NIH-funded T32 Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Integrative Medicine at Harvard and is a faculty physician in primary care, a scientific investigator, internationally recognized as a leader in the field of integrative medicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Ye. I am just thrilled to meet you and to hear your thoughts. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that really kind introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel with uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Yonke. Um, so let me just start uh, with my opening remarks a little bit um, in terms of how I think about the relationship of Qigong and Western medicine. So I think it's uh, it's helpful to sort of think about a couple frameworks. So the first is um, within the vantage point of academic medicine, I think that Qigong fits sort of within this broader category of mind-body medicine or mind-body therapies, um, and particularly movement-based mind-body therapies or exercise. Um, and in this group of therapies, we often talk about practices like yoga or Tai Chi and Qigong, right? Um, so I think it's really helpful to think about Qigong in this context, both for understanding kind of the popularity and the growth of Qigong in the United States, its, its dissemination, um, you know, amongst the general population, and also its acceptance among the medical community. Uh, it's also important because when we talk about Qigong and its clinical applications um, or in what medical populations it might be helpful, we can really leverage all of the clinical research that's been done across uh, this larger category of mind-body therapies. So much of my own work has been uh, studies of Tai Chi interventions. Um, and certainly in the scientific literature, there's a very close relationship between Tai Chi and Qigong um, and sometimes it's just semantics, right? As, as in many of the Tai Chi studies uh, in, actually include Qigong exercises. Um, so we can really leverage all of those studies to inform uh, Qigong's applications in medicine. And I think it's also important to think about Qigong in this larger category of mind-body therapies because it also helps to inform um, the mechanisms and the potential pathways of how we might think about how does Qigong act or how does it work, right? So recognizing Qigong as perhaps a meditative or a mindfulness-based therapy also allows us to look at all of those studies um, that have investigated you know, the neurophysiology um, of these mind-body therapies, imaging studies, genomic studies, um, studies that look at the biopsychosocial impact of mind-body therapies. So that's, that's one framework um, of mind-body medicine. The second framework that I think is really important to consider um, Qi Gong uh, within in is this fra framework of whole person health. So this terminology of whole person health is really increasingly uh, being used in Western medicine. And that, uh, that whole person health recognizes this holistic approach to health and uh, that's very congruent with Eastern philosophies, right? So whole person health recognizes the interconnections of the body systems, how our physical self, our emotions, our cognitions, our behaviors all influence the individual, as well as how that individual sits within 
you know, their, their relationships and the environment and all of that coming together to impact a person's health. And so mind-body therapies like Tai Chi and Qigong are these multidimensional practices that we talk about affecting those multiple dimensions of whole person health. So a lot of my, uh, my own research, we've looked at Tai Chi Qigong interventions in patients with chronic cardiovascular and pulmonary conditions like heart failure, coronary heart disease, and COPD. And much of those... Um, much of the patients in, in these studies are older, deconditioned, and sedentary individuals. And so we've looked at Tai Chi and Qigong as exercises to help promote physical activity. And in fact, there's this growing evidence to support um, these Eastern movement practices and the science of behavior change, like physical activity. So I'm going to stop there, um, and I'll let the others speak. And I look forward to further discussion about Qigong and its relationship with Western medicine and how it can help um, um, and benefit our health. Thank you, Dr. Ye. We're gonna move now to Dr. Shin Lin. And Professor Shin Lin received his PhD in biological chemistry from UCLA and was previously the chairman of biophysics at Johns Hopkins University. He presently teaches and conducts research on cell biology and integrative medicine and is a member of the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute at the University of California, Irvine. Welcome, Dr. Lin. Everyone is looking forward to hearing about your work and your research related to this important subject. I'm a laboratory scientist uh, by training and by background, uh, particularly in cell biology and biophysics, as you mentioned. So I'm very interested uh, in the meaning of the word, or well, the term qigong, you know, the, the work in Chinese, the work of qi. Uh, well, as you all know, uh, the word qi comes from thousands of years ago. Uh, we don't really have a, a modern scientific definition of qi. So how do we, in the laboratory, go ahead and try to understand the benefits of uh, qigong mind-body practices to the mind and the body. Um, the focus of our laboratory is to use, um, you know, all of the latest uh, technologies, instrumentations, measurements and things to look at this fundamental principle of Qigong and traditional Chinese medicine, so-called blood is the mother of qi. Now, we can't really define qi very well, it's some kind of energy, but blood, we certainly know how to measure all aspects of blood. Uh, so in our laboratory, uh, we use conventional technology, certainly like, you know, EKG, uh, blood pressure, and particularly using laser Doppler photometry to measure local blood circulation. And then at the same time, uh, measure energy to the extent that we could measure laboratory, like heat, light, electricity uh, in the laboratory. So we focus on how um, when you practice Qigong and Tai Chi, uh, what happens to blood flow and the flow of electricity, the emission of light, so-called biophotons from the body, electrons from the body. Uh, and also, um, because I'm also trained in uh, Chinese medicine, including acupuncture and so forth. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing how the effects produced by the practice of Qigong uh, is similar to the effects of like acupuncture, well, therapeutic, therapeutic massage, uh, topical herbal medicine and so forth, how these therapies uh, would produce similar effects. So that's what we've been doing in our laboratory for mind, body, signaling, and energy research at the University of California. Thank you. And now, Dr. Roger Janka, OMD. Dr. Janka is one of the most respected luminaries in the fields of mind, body practice, wellness, and integrative medicine. And he has dedicated his professional life to sharing the holistic healing traditions of China. 
Dr. Jonka is the director and chief instructor of the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi in Santa Barbara, California, and the author of the highly regarded books, The Healer Within and The Healing Promise of Qi. Welcome. Great to see you again, as always. Thank you, Sharon, uh, always, and good to see you again, too. And uh, first, I just want to say I'm, I'm thrilled to be in the company of these luminaries who've been involved in these things. And uh, these two people that have spoken so far, are uh, they are not uh, come lately to these ideas. They've been doing research for decades. Uh, I've been to uh, Dr. Shinlin's laboratory and uh, with all the pipes and wires and, uh, you know, all the leads that go to the different devices and so forth for um, analyzing the uh, functional uh, aspects of uh, Qigong type practices. Uh, just amazing. My background is in Chinese medicine. Uh, I went to uh, medical school in, as a younger person, and I was actually quite uh, uh, disappointed. And the reason was that I was very interested in prevention, uh, disease prevention. And the, uh, the uh, professors at that medical school when I would ask them, is there someone who could be my mentor uh, in, the, in the realm of uh, disease prevention, what they would say is actually uh, doctors uh, diagnose and treat diseases. And, and so we, we really don't know much about the idea of prevention. And uh, I found that... <laughs> at minimum distressing. And actually, I, I was a little embarrassed to find out that, that we're talking about Western medicine here. So I'll just say Western medicine's lack of interest in the whole idea of preventing diseases. And uh, so I became a, a doctor of Chinese medicine, uh, which was just an absolutely fascinating experience clinically over 35 years uh, here in Santa Barbara, California. Although starting, I have to say, starting at a holistic clinic in Columbus, Ohio, my home state, uh, in 1977. And uh, it was the one of the first integrative medicine clinics in the modern world. Of course, in the ancient times, all clinics uh, had uh, herbs and massage and, and so forth. The Chinese uniquely have acupuncture, which is pretty fascinating. But what's really interesting about that is that acupuncture didn't happen in the history of Chinese medicine until 2,000 years ago. And so given the fact that Chinese medicine is probably uh, 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 years, if you think about humans taking care of each other, um, acupuncture is, is actually a, a very recent technology breakthrough in, in, in Chinese medicine. So allow me to speak for a moment to the question of what is it that Chinese medicine does? And then I'll speak for a moment to what is it that makes it hard for doctors of Western medicine to get comfortable with the idea of uh, Chinese medicine and to, to make those referrals and therefore to have a significant effect on populations of people who are suffering from disease challenges? So in Western medicine, we have one way to do things, and that is that we have to wait until a person is sick enough to be able to tell that they're sick. And most people can't tell that they're sick uh, until they've been sick for a really long time. And so the ecology of the human system has already been disrupted and degenerating by the time a person has a heart attack or, or has an asthma attack or or, or uh, you know, you get the drift of what I mean. 
So the, the concept in Western medicine is diagnose and treat disease. Uh, of course, that's a part of Chinese medicine as well, to be able to diagnose and treat disease. But there's another aspect of Chinese medicine, which is just absolutely mesmerizing. And that is what is often uh, translated into English as maximizing the righteous. Maximizing the righteous. And of course, in the Western world, we think righteousness has something to do with a, a, a religion. Uh, in, in the Chinese view, the use of a word that translates into the maximizing of the righteous actually means discovering what is right about a person to be able to harmonize, harmonize the uh, right function. And of course, if right function is at a high level, then the person will naturally cure any kind of disease that they're having unless they have an accident or they have some kind of a genetic challenge. And so uh, if, if maximizing the righteous is the foundation or one of the foundations of Chinese medicine, then if people do maximize the righteous, then why do they need a doctor? And of course, in ancient communities, the whole idea of the doctor wasn't so much to treat sick people, although that was very possible and very sophisticated. It was to be able to help people to stay well so that they could do the farming, the hunting, the gathering, and the so forth. So the uninterrupted uninter history of Chinese medicine which is based on this idea of keeping people well, is just, you know, wow, got my attention. And I, I love being a clinician and I love being a detective of uh, real diseases and using herbal medicine, acupuncture and so forth to help them to, uh, to, to recover their well-being. But the thing that I really loved was the whole idea of this maximizing the righteous factor. And what I found is that most people who go to doctors don't want to hear about what they should do for themselves. They want to have that doctor figure their situation out and then fix them. And uh, so, you know, if I finally re retired, became the director of a training uh, center for Qigong and Tai Chi teachers, we've trained 3,000 people all around the world. Uh, and you know, so love Qigong and Tai Chi, Kung Fu, even that's even more fun for me. And so then the last thing to say is, well, what is it that can that Qigong and Tai Chi can do for, for Western medicine? Or how can they integrate and work together? And I'll just be bold and say that the first thing is that everybody should maximize the righteous through nutrition rest, hydration, uh, activity, physical activity, meditation, exposure to nature. These are all called in China, yang sheng, which basically means Chinese wellness program from 10,000 years ago. And so this, all of this is very unfamiliar to the Western world. And um, over the years, I was able to develop a few relationships with some of the MDs and uh, other types of doctors in my community. But that was very, very, very rare. And I worked on that pretty hard. So I think that the punchline is, and how I've really devoted the rest of my professional life, is let's forget about trying to prove something to Western medicine. Although I've done research and published research, and I'm, I'm always ready to have a conversation about that. But instead, go to the people and support the people in understanding the difference between waiting until you're sick enough to be diagnosed to, uh, to, uh, to have a medical response that then doesn't even ask you to be thoughtful about your own life. Instead, 
do yoga, do meditation, do qigong, do tai chi, do kung fu, walk in nature, and uh, get excited about how powerful the naturally occurring, that's the title of my book, The Healer Within, based on qigong, how to turn on the medicine within. And, and I'll leave it there, and thank you so much. Thank you. So now we have some interesting questions to explore. And to kind of take off from what you were just talking about, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Ye, being a primary care physician now, how do you see Qigong fitting into the way that Western medicine is currently practiced? Thank you for that question. And, and I do want to respond a little bit to what was just said. Um, as, you know, as a physician um, in, the West, in Western medicine myself, I don't feel like I speak for all of Western medicine, of course, but, um, but I, I do um, uh, agree with sort of, the, you know, a, a maybe a, um, a less of an emphasis on prevention in the past, but I do think that, that these days um, there's much more recognition of, of uh, the um, the value, you know, of preventive medicine and thinking preventively. Um, and also um, to say that the, you know, at the level of the Na National Institutes of Health, you know, there's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health that really has moved forward this, um, this thinking of whole person health and thinking about uh, that area of, of salutogenesis. So not just treating disease once it happens, but really finding that sweet spot in between uh, you know, a person's wellness, but then, um, but maybe not quite uh, well, but not quite disease. So helping the pe people push towards that sort of well side. Um, and I think that, you know, Qigong and Tai Chi and all of these practices have a really uh, valuable spot, you know, within, within that, um, that, that thinking about whole person and he health and how we can, how we can um, uh, do do this and there's there's really been quite an enormous amount of uh, I guess receptivity um, you know to these to these thoughts and principles and and again as I shared in the beginning you know thinking about uh, qigong and tai chi as this, these mind body therapies there's really been a lot of 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 uh, um, interest you know in in using this. Uh, you know, in the medical, in for medical conditions, uh, as well as, uh, you know, in the general population. Um, and a lot of, you know, research studies that are looking at, um, you know, how it can help with falls and balance, how it helps with, you know, your cardiopulmonary um, um, fitness, uh, you know, patients with cardiovascular disease or hypertension and blood pressure, as well as, you know, with, uh, helping with cognition and, and a whole slew of studies looking at mental health and wellness and, um, you know, sleep and, uh, you know, so, so there really is a, a, um, an opportunity, I think, um, and particularly over the last year or so, you know, with COVID, I think it's been a, um, opportunity for integrative medicine, mind, body medicine to really step up, um, because there's been a, kind of, I guess, a realization, unfortunately, you know, with the pandemic of how, how, um, how everybody's been so affected in terms of, um, you know, the importance of mental health and the importance of all of these sort of things that you're talking about doing, you know, paying attention to your diet and, and your mental health and exercising and doing um, these types of meditative therapies or mindfulness and Tai Chi and Qigong um, and how that can really help to support um, salutogenesis and wellness. Thank you. So I have a question for you, Dr. Lin, and that is, I, you know, I'm aware that you're doing a lot of experiments in your laboratory. Um, and I'm just wondering if chi can be measured in the laboratory. That's my first question. And the second thing is, I mean, I know you're doing these experiments. Um, are you finding that qigong produces similar measurable effects on the body as other traditional Chinese medical therapies? First of all, um, what I want to like echo some of the things that had just been spoken. Um, 
a lot of surveys and talking to a lot of colleagues in the medical communities. Um, the doctors are really interested nowadays in getting the patients to do Qigong and Tai Chi and so forth because of all the clinical trials and things showing that they're beneficial. But they also uh, would like to see like the, the mechanisms. So uh, we need to talk to them in a language that they would understand. If you say, oh, do Qigong and your Qi will go up, they don't know what you're talking about. Okay. But if you say, well, you do Qigong, and because you know, blood is the mother of Qi, it will enhance your blood circulation. And they will say, oh, well, that's a good thing. Okay. Well, we understand that. Um, so, like I said, you know, we simultaneously measure uh, blood flow using laser Doppler and also look at primarily the flow of energy that's measurable, whether or not this is, you know, truly a component of what's called Qi a thousand years ago, but at least it's a, a type of energy we could measure. So we simultaneously measure uh, at a particular point of the body, you know, like, like the palm of the hand or the lower back muscle, upper back, and so forth. Uh, to see when you do Qigong exercises, uh, how blood flow would be enhanced. Certainly it would, okay. But we found that very interestingly, there's a coordinated increase in the flow of electricity from one acupuncture point to another acupuncture point. We're not talking about skin conductance. This is a um, kind of a high level measurement developed by the late Motoyama from Japan. And we can measure the flow of electricity, uh, it's called the free polarization conductance uh, that flows within the tissue. And we could see that uh, these two measurements like, you know, go hand in hand. Um, so we can explain to Western medical colleagues that, yeah, well, you know, um, when you do these exercises, your blood flow in increases. Oh yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, uh, also, uh, electrical flow would increase. They said, well, what do you mean by that? How is that a good thing? So as a cell biologist, um, we go to the laboratory and we look at, you know, the flow of electricity. How does that affect cells in culture, grown in culture? So we're not talking about placebo effect. You know, these are cells taken from the body of people from normal people, from tumors, from animals. And we can show that, um, when you expose these cells to an DC electric field, you know, created by a flow of electricity, uh, we could drive these cells, you know, to go from one point to another point in terms of directionality, the speed and so forth. And, uh, you know, that has a lot of significance. In terms of wound healing, um, you know, replacement of uh, you know uh, issues, uh, you know after wounding and so forth. So Western medicine says, okay, well, well, that's interesting. So those are some of the studies that we focus on, and um, we don't work with uh, patients. Uh, I primarily work with um, the medical students, and particularly. Uh, the fellows, the residents, because we have the train temporary. You know? <laughs> so in our medical school, you know, we have uh, integrated medicine tracks for not just family medicine, but in any physiology, uh, in hospice care, in palliative care. So uh, I teach these uh, fellows, uh, start them young, you know, the residents and fellows about, you know, the clinical trials and the mechanisms that are now getting reviewed by laboratory studies such as ours, and they get very excited and uh, hopefully they will spread the word to their colleagues and uh, use it in their practice. Thank you. That was very interesting. And I'm really happy to hear that you work with young uh, doctors, uh, young fellows. I think that's definitely a great plan. We also um, have programs where our medical school sent people like myself to go to the local clinics and uh, educate people at that level. Well, you know, not just the doctors at the, the, 
the local communities, but uh, also the you know the whole healthcare staff over there and uh, teach them some basic Qigong exercises so that they can teach their patients and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I'm going to come back to you about the second part of my question, but my next question actually is for you, uh, Dr. Janka, and that is, you know, um, Dr. Ye made the, the, gave us the context of Qigong as being part of uh, mind-body medicine, as being part of this whole person health idea. And my question for you is, what distinguishes Qigong within that mind-body medicine context? What is it about Qigong that makes it unique, different, uh, you know, whatever you want, whatever word you want to ascribe to it. Yes, uh, Sharon, thanks. A couple things to say. First, uh, to the comments that came before, I do want to highlight the fact that uh, it is correct that there is more interest in these things, and it is correct that uh, understanding the mechanism is, is, is really quite profound. And one of the things that I really love is the the discovery that uh, practices like the ones we're describing I have an influence on gene expression. Uh, when I was in Chinese medicine school, I uh, sort of shyly raised my hand and asked the question, does, does Chinese medicine have an influence on the genes? And of course, my 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 thought was the person would say, "Well, no, you know, it's just, or we don't know." And but instead, the teacher, a woman, a uh, quite interesting woman, doc, Chinese doctor, said, "Absolutely," and then went on with a beautiful uh, discussion about how qi, when it's organized, it has an influence on you know practically everything. And so. Uh, this concept of uh, integrative medicine, holistic medicine, lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, uh, mind-body medicine, and and whole health, that's a lot of different kinds of uh, areas of interest, and they are entry portals for all kinds of doctors, MDs, uh, osteopaths, chiropractors, and so forth. So we are definitely on the on the front end at this point. Before it was like climbing up. Now it's kind of like surfing down the other side of this very large mountain of resistance that existed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera. So then on to your uh, question, Sharon. Uh, this will seem odd, perhaps, but I'm going to say at the essential level, there is no difference. And here's why. Take meditation, take yoga, take Tai Chi, take any other kind of contemporary mind-body practice and ask the question, what are they made up of? What are the parts? And uh, the traditional idea in China is that they are made up of the three treasures. And there are many versions of the three, three treasures. One is called Jing Qi Shen. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to many other versions of the three treasures. And one of the most profound versions and practical versions of the three treasures is body, breath, and mind. The regulation, the personal, self initiated regulatory capacity of changing the body in movement and posture. And if anybody's listening who wants to adjust their posture and lift their head and drop their shoulders, please do. Breath, deepen and relax your breath. And the uh, easiest way to manage the mind is give it something to do that isn't uh, a part of how you're worrying or concerned. And of course, so if you do yoga or qigong gestures or tai chi or, or kung fu, any of those, you're focusing on that, and that is happening in the present. And so this all leads to this concept of 
presencing. And all of these practices have as the underlying feature of how they work is presencing, which means basically disassociating from everything else and focusing on the practice in the present moment. And there's a beautiful new science word. Uh, and there are, there are a couple of new science words. By the way, I'll throw one out just very quickly, and then I'll throw the second one out and explain it. The first one is, you know about rehab, but how many people are talking about prehab? Prehab means preparing for surgery, doing Qigong for before you go to surgery rather than waiting until after. The other word that I want to describe here is interoception. Interoception is now uh, a big part of the conversation about all the versions of mind-body practice. And basically, it means the ability that a person has to be internally aware. So we call that self-aware, or we could say, we could say sometimes people say self-observant. The point is that we have two kinds of feeling. There's a physical feeling called, um, you know, sensation. I feel it because I feel it. And there's another, we use the same word. And how interesting is that? We use the same word, feeling, for our emotional self. And so when we bring the feeling of the physical self and the emotional self into our lives as a sustainable, practice, not just while we're doing Qigong. In fact, one of the things that we like to teach people as teachers to teach to citizens is that the practice of Qigong is to remind us of the power of the three treasures, the body practice, the breath practice, and the mind practice, so that we can use those, those awarenesses when we're in traffic, when we're waiting in the line at the bank, when we're feeling distressed, when we're in a conversation with a person who uh, has a different point of view, to be able to settle, turn attention inward, use methodologies that we have become familiar with from our practice of yoga or qigong, etc., to calm down and be present to the experience that's happening rather than, shall we say, resisting it or worrying about it. And so um, beyond that, what distinguishes Qigong is its immensely ancient history, uh, equal to yoga, because the Silk Road and all. Uh, but Tai Chi is, actually wasn't invented until about 400 years ago. So it's a very, very late comer. Um, but still, they all have this the same essential features to the practice of purposefully self-regulating the body, the breath, and the awareness. Great. Thank you so much for that detailed explanation of how Qigong fits into the mind-body uh, paradigm. And my next question is for you, Dr. Ye. And it has to do with the clinical areas uh, that are being studied now that show promising scientific evidence for the efficacy of Qigong, Tai Chi, and other mind-body practices. Great. Thank you, Sharon. I, if, if I could, I, I would love to just um, uh, respond a little bit to what was just said and, and really agree with some of um, Dr. Janka's uh, comments. Um, and one of the reasons why I originally you know, was, uh, gave this framework and how we're leveraging sort of the research in other types of mind-body therapies is because um, you mentioned ge you know, genetics or genomics. And, and I, as far as I know, there aren't any Qigong studies that, that look at epigenetics or genetics, but there's a, there's a growing body of evidence in terms of mindfulness therapies uh, that, you know, that say that, you know, actually um, some of this, these gene regulation, you know, proteins do really change with practice. And so I think that's really exciting and, and um, we can leverage that. And then also, 
that um, you know many of these therapies do have these core principles that are very similar, mind, body, and breath. The one thing that I, I do think is um, uh, uh, that uh, is different from the movement-based mind-body therapies from maybe seated meditation is really that that sort of embodied awareness. So you, t- you talked about interoceptive awareness and um, I think that's, a re- you're right, it's a, it's a hot, hot area now and something that really um, is cultivated through all of these mind-body practices. But because um, Qigong practices often um, are done together with movement, um, you know, like a Tai Chi or yoga, uh, that mindfulness cultivated with movement, uh, there's something about that dynamic um, the dynamic cultivation of of mindfulness um, that really brings you into your body and that body awareness that's so important. Um, so, if you answer your question, Sharon, in terms of the um, you know the areas that that have been studied. So, again, a, a much of my uh, vantage point is in the Tai Chi literature, and there's really um, certainly you know for balance and falls, that's probably the one of the biggest areas uh, that that uh, at least Tai Chi uh, um, has. Um, has shown a lot of promise. Um, and in the cardiovascular and pulmonary sort of area, again, much of my work looking at how it can help uh, patients with chronic cardiovascular or pulmonary diseases, um, uh, you know, helping them with their symptomatology in terms of shortness of breath and quality of life and getting people to uh, to actually exercise. So uh, one big area that I'm very interested in is it, it is in this pr- uh, behavior change, promotion of healthy behaviors. How do uh, how do things like Tai Chi and Qigong really give patients that, um, you know, you talked about self-regulation, but uh, other sort of self-referential processes like self-efficacy, people who are really deconditioned and are afraid of doing um, conventional exercise or, you know, don't want to go to rehab or afraid of doing things, giving them something to do that's uh, perhaps gentler, you know, in the beginning, um, allowing them to achieve success in small increments um, and that really feeds their self-efficacy. So so Qigong and Tai Chi can be like a bridge exercise perhaps um, to then go to something more rigorous down the line or vigorous down the line or as something, um, you know, that they can uh, cultivate um, as a as a practice and exercise in and of itself, you know. So that's that's actually a big area, um, and certainly there's been a ton of research looking at mental health. I mentioned before, and anxiety and depression and 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 decreasing stress. So stress for stress management, um, for things like uh, the movements, you know, in qigong or tai chi in particular, because um, oftentimes there's a longer form or something that you must sequence together. Uh, there's been several studies looking at neurological conditions, so things like uh, like Parkinson's or post-stroke that require sort of this cognitive motor connection to be um, to be enhanced, uh, and so that's that's another big area. Um, cancer, uh, you know, in cancer patients, mostly breast cancer, because that's uh, the most studied population of cancer, I think, um, uh, universally. Uh, but looking at um, uh, you know, patients that are going through treatment and uh, helping with fear of cancer recurrence, um, helping with, uh, you know, symptomatology, um, mental health and insomnia and things like that, you know, in cancer patients. Um, and then another uh, big area is actually musculoskeletal disease. So uh, looking at how these um, practices can actually, as exercises can help patients with um, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, et cetera. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Lin, um, I want to come back to uh, the second half of my previous question, which is about whether or not there are similar measurable effects on the body with Qigong as in other traditional Chinese medical therapies. And then after you talk about that a little bit, I'm very curious to know what is your dream research project? Like, what would you just love to do in the laboratory? Well, I think we're doing it. <laughs> oh. Um, so, you know, uh, trained as a laboratory scientist, you know, uh, our basic strategy is to dissect complex problems into simple, more simple questions. So we talk quite a bit about regulation of mind, body, and breath. So 
what we're doing and a lot of other people are doing are studying how each of these elements, you know, contribute to the overall benefits of Qigong and Tai Chi. So like uh, Bokhye just said, um, for instance, uh, Tai Chi is known, uh, been shown in many clinical trials to be very beneficial to uh, prevention of falls in the elderly. So in our laboratory, uh, we put the electrodes all over the body to measure so-called electromyography. Uh, which muscle is used during which exercise. And we can see, you know, a lot of these exercises will strengthen um, the hip flexors and the quadriceps. These are the muscles of the thigh, upper leg, uh, that's essential for keeping balance and stopping yourself from falling, okay? Um, many of these exercises uh, would uh, strengthen the lower back muscles of the PCB bossy. Well, a lot of people you know, suffer from low back pain. So you can see how stretching and strengthening those, you know, those muscles should be good. So now uh, regulation of uh, mind, uh, yes, you know, well, uh, meditative state is a, a dual state of relaxed concentration. Well, how can you relax and concentrate at the same time? Well, uh, our brain, uh, scans, you know, not scans, well, brain wave analysis, uh, of the so-called Theta waves, alpha waves, theta waves show that, yes, indeed, uh, when you're in a meditative state, uh, you are in a relaxed, concentrated state. Uh, but we went one step further. We use uh, what's called photon migration spectroscopy, and we show that the oxygen consumption in the frontal prefrontal cortex, you know, this is a part of the brain dealing with thinking, that when you're in a meditative state, you actually consuming less and less oxygen. So indeed you can actually relax, focus on a single thought and, uh, achieve, uh, you know, the desired state. Uh, and finally, you know, breathing, very exciting that, uh, the latest studies, not from our laboratories, but other lab, another laboratory showed that when you do deep, slow breathing cycles, that that pattern of deep breathing that's used in Qigong and Tai Chi is actually uh, mediated by special brain cells in the so-called breathing pacemakers in the brainstem. And these special brain cells, how are they special? They're directly linked by nerves to another part of the brain that has to do with stress response. So when you go into a deep slow breathing pattern, you are suppressing stress in a way that, you know, neurobiologists now can understand very well. So in our laboratory, we put people under stress by making them watch you know, horror movies. Okay. Clips of horror movies, the blood pressure would go up, the heart rate would go up and the so-called uh, heart rate variability that monitors the, the stress response yeah. or the ratio of stress versus relaxation. All of that will go up, but then when we tell these, uh, subjects that they're, they're not practitioners of Tai Chi Chi Gong, we just say, now, oh, okay, so breathe, you know, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, and almost immediately, you know, their stress response will go down. Uh, the heart rate will go back to normal, the blood pressure will come down and the, uh, heart rate variability would reflect the uh, more relaxed state. So we can actually dissect out some of these, uh, elements of, uh, Qigong and show in the laboratory that well, there's measurable effects. And again, this will help uh, convince, you know, the med biomedical community uh, that, you know, that's really uh, mechanisms that we can understand uh, why do these things and that will be good for this type of patients or this type of disorder. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. Um, so my last question is for you, Dr. Janka. And it's, it's an, um, a question for your imagination, which I'm sure you've thought, thought about the answer to this question before, but how do you see a future healthcare system? Like what are the components of a future healthcare system that really delivers healthcare to the greatest number of people? Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And um, beautiful question. Love the question. First, let's just say 
that there's two ways to spell healthcare. One way is you have the word health with a space and then the word care. There's another way to spell healthcare where it all goes together. The first one literally means health care. The second one is the contemporary uh, language that you'll see in all the newspapers and in, in most of the research that is really describing the finance system for medical delivery. And so my uh, imagination about a future healthcare system is that there literally is one. And right now, we don't have a healthcare system. Uh, although it is true that the financing for medical delivery is evolving, uh, I think we could probably all agree that even though there's good research and that the doctors are beginning to take interest, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are not particularly happy. The medical uh, device uh, organizations are not particularly happy because all of those kinds of things get used on people who have lost their health. And so, um, first of all, can a healthcare system actually happen in a hospital? Um, probably not very well, although uh, I have worked some with the regional hospitals here, and I've been a consultant for many hospitals as they tried to develop their integrative medicine programs or their lifestyle medicine programs. And often they put millions and millions of dollars into creating these beautiful programs. But then the other doctors don't do the referring. So I think what Dr. Shinling is doing and what Dr. Ye is doing is creating uh, a, a, a whole new cadre of um, medical providers who are actually oriented to the idea that a doctor or a medical person can actually be a part of a healthcare system. And what that means is that they will see people uh, while they're well, and this is, a, this is a rule in Chinese medicine, to be a, doc, to be a teacher. Uh, the first rule in Chinese medicine, honor the spirit. Second rule in Chinese medicine, teach people to stay well. Third rule in Chinese medicine is treat people while they're well to keep them well. In other words, now you're intervening. Of course, Chinese medicine is going to be massage, herbal medicine, and uh, acupuncture. And those kinds of treatments, imagine going, and, and, and many Chinese doctors actually have an entire load of patients who come to them at the change of the seasons to receive acupuncture and herbal uh, resources to take them through the next season. That That is, even though there's treatment there, that's medical delivery, uh, it's still a health enhancing system. So uh, then the question becomes, well, you know, what do you mean? How can you do this? Uh, how does it work? Well, how it works is that it happens in schools and churches and uh, boys clubs and girls clubs. It happens in social service agencies. Uh, the, 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 the place for intervention uh, in a person's life to be able to support them in either healing from a disease, recovering from a surgery, or to avoid getting a disease in the first place is to, to, to do prehab. Prehab means to rehabilitate your capacity, your functional capacity in advance so that you either prevent disease or can participate with the medical system to recover your, your health. So that's why the shift network is like, oh my gosh, you know, we've got now thousands and thousands and thousands of people who come to shift network courses. They don't have to go to a doctor to be, uh, to, to, to get a prescription to go to that course. They can do it as a citizen who's managing their own well-being, being in a purposeful sort of way. Uh, and um, so as I'm kind of signing off, I'll say thank you, Sharon. 
and thank you to my colleagues and um, and thank you to the Shift Network for providing a way for average citizens to become informed about how amazing the human body, mind, and spirit are. Yes, yes, yes. I totally agree, and I'm. I wish we had more time to discuss some of the other questions that all of you raised. And I look forward to another time where we might be able to continue this conversation. And I have such gratitude for all of you for what you're doing, you know, just moving the needle along a little bit, you know, making life a little better for all of us. Um, I'd like to ask you each to uh, tell our audience how they might reach you if they want to get in touch. Uh, Dr. Ye. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, you can actually find me on uh, on our website at oshercenter.org. And I also wanted to um, just put in, you know, if, if folks are interested in the research in Tai Chi and Qigong, um, we are, uh, the, the Osher Center at Harvard Medical School is going to be sponsoring a, uh, a conference a scientific conference in September of this year, uh, September 18th and 19th um, in Boston. And you can get details of that at, uh, it's uh, oshersciencetcq.org. Uh, and it will be covering all of the state of the evidence, uh, you know, of the science of Tai Chi and Qigong at that, at that conference. So thank you very much again to Sharon and my colleagues as well for this opportunity to be a part of the panel. Thank you, Dr. Ye. That's a very exciting event coming up, and I hope to be there myself. Uh, Dr. Lin, how can our audience reach you? Uh, by email. Uh, my email is very simple. It's my name, S-H-I-N-L-I-N, -I -I one word, shimlin, at U-C-I dot E-D-U. And I check my email every day, and I you know, reply to anybody who would uh, know ask questions and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Janka. Yes. And I, I want to just testify here briefly that um, that conference is definitely going to be moving the needle. And if anybody has even the slightest interest, uh, do jump in on that. And by the way, TCQ means Tai Chi Qigong. And uh, I want to honor uh, Dr. Shin Lin for being a part of a, a conference that we did uh, in 2005, which I think moved the needle, which was called the National Expert Meeting on Qigong and Tai Chi. And if you put those words into the uh, internet, you'll find information on that National Expert Meeting on uh, Qigong and Tai Chi. Uh, I can be reached at, uh, this one's also fairly simple, uh, HTTP, etc., and then the letters for the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi, which are I I Q T C dot O R G. So I I Q T C dot O R G. And if you fish around there, you'll find uh, a place to send email. And you'll also find we've got a library there. There's links to uh, a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is called The Tai Chi and Qigong Way, if you want to check that out. And um, yes, and so for the new healthcare system, what we need is just basically everybody to take better care of themselves. <laughs> I have enormous gratitude to each of you for this thought-provoking and informative conversation. And also a lot of thanks and appreciation to the Shift Network audience who makes this summit possible. We certainly wouldn't be here if there was no interest and the interest is growing. So thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.